My name is Patrick Allett and I'm a teacher. I teach outstanding undergraduates at Emory University in Atlanta. But I've also taught French and English in a Scottish prep school. I've coached my daughter's soccer team, the Tornadoes. I've taught students how to draw in Oxford, England. And I've taught all sorts of historical subjects to groups of American senior citizens. If you've seen me before, it's probably, probably because I've been making courses with the teaching company for the last few years, six of them in all, whose studios, very, very different from a classroom, required me to develop a whole new range of teaching skills. Teaching's a wonderful way of life. You're always giving students, whatever their age, something new and something interesting that will help them either directly in their work or indirectly as you introduce them to the riches of our civilization. I've been very fortunate in having an almost unbroken teaching career since my early 20s. I've always enjoyed the challenges it brings and I've been learning steadily about how to try to do it better for 30 years now. Now I don't want to imply that being a teacher is all roses. Students often don't want to do the necessary hard work that you assign them or they don't want to join in in class discussion, or they hand in their work late, or not at all, or they resent the grades that I give them. It's possible to deal with all the friction that teaching creates, but it usually takes plenty of experiences as you build up an awareness of what's going to happen and how to deal with it. The teaching company asked me to make a course with them about the art of teaching, and I was very, very pleased and honoured to accept. Now what is it that brought us together, especially since I'm a foreigner? Well, they knew I was an enthusiastic teacher. I've been inspired by great teachers throughout my life, starting out quite early, very early. My own father was a high school physics teacher, and he gave me a high sense of a teacher's need for self-control, self-improvement, and hard work. He was also a World War II veteran, a veteran of the Royal Air Force. And as a kid, I just couldn't get enough of his stories about his life in the military. To me, it seemed wildly adventurous and exciting. And I think one of the reasons I became a historian was because of the stories he told me about the war. All the kids in my generation were the children of, or nearly all were the children of veterans. And uh, so it was, it was that, plus his teaching, which encouraged me to become a teacher as well. When I was in high school, I had a wonderful history teacher called Mr. Ivan Way. And he was the first person who really made me feel the contingency of history. The fact that just because things did turn out a certain way, didn't mean that they were bound to turn out that way. And suddenly got me back into the feeling that if you were living in 1910 or 1920 or 1961, things really could have gone in different ways. He was very, very good at conveying to students, me among them, the idea that the links between the past and the present are powerful and real. He came from County Durham in the northeast of England, a coal mining district, which for, for decades had suffered from very, very acute poverty. And uh, he brought home to me the reality of the kind of suffering which generations of mining families had had to endure, working underground, suffering from lung diseases, periodically perishing in, in mining cave-ins. I really started to feel the intensity of history, not just as it related to great events like the wars and the, the doings of the kings and queens, but also the history of ordinary people in ordinary work, struggling with everyday uh, problems. So his teaching was very emotionally powerful and had a lasting effect on me. I'm still in touch with him today and I honour him very much for the effects of his teaching. I went to college at Oxford University. I was a student at Hartford College, Oxford in the mid-1970s. And there I was introduced to the rigours of the tutorial system. This is a very gruelling form of one-on-one -on -one teaching which is designed to turn callow schoolboys into intellectually self-confident adults. Now, here's how, the, here's how the system works. The student every week is told to write a paper, to research it widely, write the paper, and then go along to meet the professor one-on-one. -on -one. And the tutorial is an hour long, and it begins with the student reading aloud the paper he or she has just written. Straight away there, the fact that you've got to read your paper aloud to the teacher means you're probably going to work harder on it because you don't want to sound weak, and you certainly don't want to sound ridiculous. Now, in those days, 
um, still in the 70s, the teachers weren't specially interested in the students' self-esteem. If, if the tutor thought your paper was bad, he'd say so with blunt directness. And I remember some squirming tutorials, especially in the early days, when I clearly hadn't done enough work or I hadn't thought carefully enough about what, was, what needed to be done and I hadn't understood necessary connections. Gradually, I started to realise that the, um, the teacher's toughness was a response to their perception that I and my fellows were capable of doing work of this kind, but that we had to be goaded into doing it, if necessary, by frank criticism. I learned an enormous amount from the tutorial system, uh, both uh, as a student, how to be a more effective student, but also I was watching the teachers and realizing, ah, look at the effectiveness of the way in which they're imposing high standards on me to enable me to live up to them. From Oxford, I went on a vacation to America and then came back to America the following year, 1978, where I enrolled as a graduate student at the University of California in Berkeley. And there I was part of a, a generation of, of aspiring American historians learning at Cal, a beautiful and, and magnificent place. Now there, really for the first time, I learned about seminar teaching. The teaching at Oxford had nearly all been one-on-one, -on -one, which it certainly has its strengths. It also does have limitations. By contrast, at Berkeley, the normal thing was to be in a seminar of about 10 or 12 or 15. We all did the same readings, and then we came to discuss them uh, with the oversight of the professor. And again, straight away, I was introduced to the profound seriousness of this work and the, and the recognition that it could be done very, very intensively indeed. There was a wonderful esprit de corps among my generation at Berkeley. Very often we'd meet the night before to go over the main issues in the reading so that when it came to discussing them in front of the professor we could put on a good show. That was my first introduction to seminars and I've remained convinced ever since that they're a superb way of learning because they, um, they expose the students to each other's insights and then offer the additional help of the teacher's guidance as well. And from that time, almost from then up to the present, I've been teaching seminars. Also at Berkeley, I became a teacher for the first time. With no training at all, I took on two groups of 20 high-spirited young Californians. The way it worked at Berkeley, and the way it worked at most graduate schools in those days, and to a large extent still does today, is that there's no formal training. You're simply told, now it's your turn to teach. The presumption seems to be, if you understand the material, surely you're going to be able to convey it to the students. Now, of course, the reality is that that's not true, but certainly that's the expectation that was laid on us. And I and all my colleagues had to fumble our way to an effective way of classroom teaching. And the poor old undergraduates with whom we were, on, on whom we were practicing had to put up with the, the early mistakes we made. And I made all the mistakes. Over the course of the next 23 lectures, I'll be telling you about many of the things not to do in the classroom. And uh, please be reassured that I did all of them and know from personal experience the way in which mistakes in teaching are painful for the students and painful for you, the teacher, as well. The trick is always to learn from them. After graduate school, after I'd finished writing a doctoral dissertation, itself a terrible struggle, I became a postdoctoral fellow at Harvard Divinity School. I was a specialist in American religious history. Then in 1988, I got a job at Emory University, and I've been working there ever since. Emory's a lovely place to work, and I've had the good fortune of being there while the university has been improving. From year to year, it becomes more selective. It becomes more difficult for high school kids to get into Emory because we can afford to be more selective about whom we take. And so from my point of view as a teacher, it's very gratifying to work there because usually when I put a lot of work into preparing a class, the students are putting a lot of work in as well. And so I feel my time was well spent in getting it ready.